morning. Thank you for being here. This is uh, Steve Conklin, Chair, and uh, this is Tuesday, September 19th, 2023 meeting of the Regional Transportation Committee. I call this meeting to order, uh, and we will open up if there is any public comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't see any hands raised remotely or in person. I don't see any public comment at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Cam. Uh, item number three attached is the August 15th, 2023 RTC meeting summary for your information. And with that, we will move ahead into uh, several informational briefings. Our first is from the Colorado Department of Transportation Region 1 Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Study. Kelly Klein Felter, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, today, I am going to be introducing um, the CDOT Region 1 Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Study. Um, Zeb here will be giving the presentation on it, but I just wanted to give a quick, quick little intro on how it connects to our work. Um, as you're aware, in Metro Vision, we have our objectives, and two of those are safety and active transportation. So. Um, to be aligned with that work and our active transportation plan and our regional vision zero plan. Dr. Cog um, participated as a part of the um, advisory committee for this study and we participated in all this um, uh, different meetings and workshops and even in-person um, site visits to help out with the safety study and we're really excited for what the um, results of it are to help us guide where we can fund um, better safety projects that increase active transportation um, access and safety and mobility in the region. So with that, um, Azeb, take it away. Thank you, Emily. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Azia Seifu. I uh, work in CDOT Region 1 Traffic and Safety um, Operation Unit. Here to present to you again, like Emily said, uh, CDOT Region 1 Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Study. Um, thank you, Dr. Carr, for the opportunity. Um, so uh, I have been a project manager being involved in this study alongside with uh, Michael Baker, international consultant. So the goal of the study was to improve safety of bicycle and pedestrian on uh, CDOT Region 1 roadways. Um, the overall intent of the study was to complete the uh, both proactive, more of like a systemic analysis and a reactive um, approach to uh, crash data-driven analysis um, for bicycle and pedestrians. Um, the guide uh, to identify known crash history, um, areas of higher uh, potential risk, areas of bicycle and pedestrians concern, and a list of safety countermeasures uh, that can be applied to uh, our state or local roadways. Um, one thing to note, um, the final billet so the reports is also to support future safety grant applications. Um, the, so that means to be useful tools uh, for identification of uh, programs or projects and working collaboratively with local agency on funding opportunities by leveraging its data, recommendations, uh, concept designs, and cost estimate uh, information to successfully pursue for grant applications um, as implementing the safety uh, countermeasures of state and local roads. Uh, the project team involved uh, Region 1 CDOT staff, RTD, Dr. Cog, uh, especially that Region 1 is fully encompassed within Dr. Cog region. Uh, the project team met uh, three to four um, times a week, um, uh, every week, uh, every other week, or to discuss project progresses. Um, there was also Technical Advisory Committee um, that met five times throughout the project. Um, there were up to two members of each uh, county and cities and towns uh, that were involved. Uh, the goal of the TAC members was uh, to review technical assumptions and processes, disseminate that information to the public and local agency staff uh, to gather feedback on um, constructively voice their opinion, uh, uh, their community's opinion and um, perspective on bicycle and pedestrian safety. 
Uh, so the study um, included the screening of CDOT network that was conducted. Um, it's also known as network screening. Um, network screening is an evaluation of crash history, um, available roadway data to help identify roadways with potential for higher risk. Um, the network screening was conducted in two-step crash uh, analysis and systemic analysis. Um, the first step that we took was uh, getting the crash analysis um, on CDOT roads within the Region 1. Um, so the re we were able to review five years of crash data from July 2015 to uh, June 2020. Um, there were about 2,222 total uh, pedestrian bicycle crashes, um, and 68% of that was uh, pedestrian, and 32% were um, bicycle crashes. So the overall intent of the analysis was to determine the crash um, involving bicycle and pedestrians uh, were occurring on CDOT roads and um, where they were concentrated on the network and what the level of severity was for each of these crashes, uh, looking at fatality, um, injury, and property damage only. And we took all the roads of, uh, within the region and broke them into half a mile uh, segments to score based on the number of severity of bicycle and pedestrian crashes where uh, fatality crash would receive 100 points, um, uh, injury crash would receive 50 points, and PDO would receive 25 points. And then we were able to, uh, for each of those segments, add all those um, uh, crash scores and come up with, uh, they were identified as higher um, uh, scores, giving anything 400 points or above will be considered as uh, identified that we'd be a higher risk. So from that list of segments, we were able to identify 15 crash hotspot locations, uh, where 12 of them are intersection, and three were segments. Um, as you see on the right of the screen here, there's a map that shows, that runs east-west uh, with um, black is Colfax Avenue. Um, this is the highest scoring uh, within the region. Uh, it's being considered as highest density and severity of crashes. Uh, one point to note, um, while we were doing this, the high scoring crash location within the city and county of Denver was identified as uh, the study that was not evaluated further for potential countermeasures because at the time, city and county of Denver were doing a similar effort to address bicycle and pedestrian safety. Again, these are uh, the 15 locations uh, referenced in the preceding slide. Um, these locations have ranged from highest uh, number of severities of crashes within the region um, and scoring of ranging from 1,000 to 400 points. Includes um, 11 of these locations are on Colfax, um, where seven are in City of Aurora, uh, six are in City of Lakewood, and um, two are in City of Glendale. So the second component we looked into is the systemic analysis. Um, this analysis evaluated 10 roadway characteristics, also what we call them as risk factors. Uh, to determine the level of risk they pose on bicycle and pedestrian. Um, some of them are listed here, like looking at the average daily traffic volume, uh, presence of lighting, posted speed limit, soldier width, presence of sidewalk uh, or bike lane. So after reviewing this risk scores uh, or risk factors, risk scores were uh, calculated based on the relative level of risk. Each factor adds to the roadway network, for instance, if you're looking at a facility or a roadway with 45 miles per hour or higher, would be considered as a high risk compared to um, a roadway with 30 miles per hour or less. So the scores were then applied to each of the half a mile segment that we were able to pull in from the crash uh, analysis portion of the study. 
And this map shows the results of the, the combined risk scores by segments. Um, the segments with higher risk are shown in red, uh, which was considering representing higher uh, need for relations to bicycle and pedestrian safety and uh, the consideration of countermeasures. Orange and yellow uh, represents uh, lower level of risk. Um, as many of you know, uh, the systemic analysis is becoming more common these days um, through safety studies. Um, that is a proactive approach to identifying areas that may or may not have, uh, that may have elevated risk but may not have the crash data available. So the location with fire, fewer crashes, such as the suburbs, um, this data can be used, uh, useful to help justify safety countermeasures when applying for safety grants. So as part of that systemic analysis, uh, network screening was uh, part of that we're able to pull in with the public input. Uh, we, we used online interactive survey called MetroQuest. It was available for six weeks. Um, the survey participants were asked to provide just general input on um, and ideas, thoughts on obstacle they face that they are biking or biking, uh, walking um, in the region, and just general input on the ideas of the map of the region itself. There were uh, over 2,300 people that participated, and uh, we were able to also receive 5,800 data points on the mapping portion of the survey. Um, the heat map you see on the right um, with blue dots that spread out uh, shows the areas of individual or fewer comments received. Um, and then the red or the hot uh, yellow um, concentration of comments that were higher concentration of comments that were received. So this map demonstrates where demand exists for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure and support the improvements of um, where likely high due to the, the volume of comments received. Um, so this area is like where we have the participation comments were identified as hotspots, uh, were cross-referenced with the systemic uh, risk scores and placed in order of highest to lowest for systemic risk uh, scores. And the next slide um, shows that range where we consider these as MetroQuest hotspots. <clears throat> um, these are some of the locations that would likely show up on um, grant applications in perspective of the stakeholders' support and just the level of systemic risk scores. Um, it can also be seen that the highest score spans from Lakewood to um, Aurora, uh, and then the next highest being from Aurora to City of Brew. Um, and then this is the next level of uh, the MetroQuest hotspots with um, lower systemic scores, but includes like Golden, um, and incorporated Jefferson County, uh, and Town of Bennett. Uh, these locations did receive a lot of comments, but they scored low uh, when we are looking at the systemic analysis. Um, and then, you know, it was also important for the team to consider other factors um, that could not feasibly be evaluated through the systemic risk scores or that could not be noted as by participants of the MetroQuest uh, survey. Uh, since all of Region 1 falls within the Dr. Cog boundary, it was easy to incorporate their data into the systemic hotspot location. Um, where we were able to reference in the pedestrian focus area, uh, vulnerability by uh, census tract and high injury network. Um, also uh, considering things like surrounding land use, uh, proximity to transit stations, um, concentration of existing proposed bike pet facilities, uh, and just the balance between the urban and rural location, as well as the boundary roads to uh, look at the list again and to bring what, what to bring to the top. So in summary, we're you know, using the Dr. Cog data, aerial imagery, and just input from the TAC, um, the 
uh, the team documented uh, the contacts factors correlated with each of the hot uh, metricas hotspot uh, locations. This diagram just gives us a summary of what I was just mentioning um, to come up with that systemic hotspot locations. So we were able to take in the MetroQuest hotspots uh, and evaluate that against the systemic risk scores, contacts factor, and any uh, planned or funded improvements that are underway uh, were excluded from the list of systemic hotspot locations. Uh, this is the list for the systemic hotspot locations um, where you would notice two of those locations they would uh, between cities and counties, like for instance, uh, City of Westminster and Adams County, or the uh, City of Whitridge and Lakewood. Uh, these locations um, are noted as being uh, areas of significant concern, just given how much coordination would require to improve the type of location. Uh, the top three locations had relatively high network risk scores. Um, medium to high level of vulnerability, um, and we're located on high injury network. Uh, the first one is located with quarter mile of the RTD station. Uh, the second would provide missing link to planned multi-use trail. Um, the third one also came up on from the list of crash uh, location, although it was uh, lower on the list. As we um, did mention earlier about considering also locations within uh, the rural areas and just the distribution of that from compared to the urban as well. The bottom three, town of Bennett, um, also were considered as rural areas that made it to this list. Um, they had medium level vulnerability um, and provide a connection to schools, uh, parks, and libraries in the area. Uh, but it should be noted that transportation projects uh, with the focus of bicycle and pedestrian safety uh, that are planned or underway were excluded uh, from the top systemic locations. So combining the two lists, uh, the crash hotspot and the systemic hotspot location, we were able to come up with um, the 11 top locations uh, as identified in the study. And the location with the list of crash hotspots are uh, five here, uh, with four of them are in City of Aurora and one in uh, City of Grindel. And the list of systemic hotspot location that we referenced in the previous slide, are, there are six of them here. So after reviewing all the data, uh, conducting site visits, uh, the site-specific data was used to identify a list of potential countermeasures uh, at each location. Um, just to name a few, the top countermeasures that we were able to look into um, include more common one improvements like the curb extension, signal rebuild, um, protected mid-block crossings, um, and maybe less common ones would be uh, shifting uh, left turn lanes to remove the negative offset, uh, tightening up curb radius to slow vehicles, um, and also replacing travel lane with lower um, and wider median for a pedestrian refuge. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, these countermeasures, um, they're not always contact sensitive. Um, are not likely to apply everywhere. Um, there is a section in the report that lists out the acceptable countermeasures that could be used and um, when to apply the pros and cons of each as well for a good resource. So the next step for CDOT was to invest in um, these top projects or locations. Um, under design with Vision Zero funding, uh, we have Colfax from Moline to Peoria. Colfax and Havana, uh, Colfax and Chambers, all three in the city of Aurora, and then um, with uh, Town of Bennett, Colfax and Adams, uh, First Street and Centennial uh, were considered. <clears throat> uh, also looking at um, providing HSIP and faster application for Colfax and Moline, Palmer Avenue from Colfax to 8th, uh, Wadsworth and 26th, 
in the segments of 26 to 29. Um, and then the last three, uh, actually the two of them on the last uh, list here, we were able to uh, provide funding while the study was happening, um, US 287 70th Avenue with um, Highway Safety Improvement pra uh, Program funds, Wadsworth and 32nd Avenue, and the segment from 32nd to 35th with uh, Dr. Cog Transportation Improvement Program funds. And the last one, uh, Corridor, Mississippi, CDOT will be working with CCD to improve that intersection. Um, it will have a signal timing improvement. So within the study, there are top locations that will benefit directly from the concept designs and cost estimate, but there's aspects of the study that the entire region can benefit from. Um, and a grant application, like the maps uh, from these studies shows uh, crash scores and system scores that can be uh, used for basis of identifying a particular roadway level of risk. Um, additionally, the list of top crash and systemic location extend beyond those that made it to the top list. Uh, so if a particular segment um, is one of these lists, it can help to justify the need for uh, improvements as well. That, any questions or comments? Happy to take any questions and comments. And just a reminder, if everybody could put your uh, name sign so I can see it if I have a uh, moment of uh, forgetfulness. So thank you. <laughs> I, I know all of you, but but... You know how that goes. So, any questions or comments? Great. Right. Dr. Ward. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess my first question is when it comes to roadway safety for bicyclists and particularly pedestrians, since you mentioned that was primary. Um, Authority injury uh, group. Is there any attempt to slow down the roadways? I mean, because honestly, walking downtown, for example, I don't necessarily feel unsafe because of the volume of cars. It's they're typically going slower, and many of the corridors that you mentioned here are not. Um, in a downtown category, but they are within a city limit category, and whether or not the posted speed limit is above or below 45 miles an hour, the actual speed that motorists are driving is probably higher than that. So is there any attempt to slow down the roadways <clears throat> to make it feel safer? Because you can put a median protection for pedestrians, but if traffic's still going 50 miles an hour, yeah, I don't care. You're not going to feel safe. Yeah, I think um, that that's a good question. Uh, those questions can be applied to, depending on the different uh, facility or roadway. Uh, maybe looking at you know areas where we can maybe include some of the countermeasures to slow um, vehicles. Just maybe adding in um, median or ball belts, uh, just a, that natural uh, movement of vehicles coming through. Corridor. It all depends on the facility and type that we're, you're considering those situations. About. So it's case by, by case. So it's, it depends on the location we're looking at and what kind of treatments that can be applied. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Um, I guess the only comment I have to that really is CDOT needs to pick whether it's going to prioritize cars or it's going to prioritize pedestrians, and one's going to have to give. And that want to focus on pedestrian safety and bike safety, you're going to have to inconvenience the car. And the way I interpret the comment you just made is, well, I don't know yet. That's kind of how I saw it. And so I would really encourage CDOT to, they're going to prioritize pedestrian and bike safety, particularly in um, the state-owned highways within uh, incorporated cities, cities and counties, they really need to go all in with bike and pedestrian safety and say, sorry, cars, you're going to have to up some of your historic freedoms. 
Felt taken. Thank you for your comment. Um, but also, we wanted, we wanted to consider all modes of traffic as well. Uh, this may be focused on pedestrian and bicycle, um, but at the same time, there's also vehicle uh, users as well, too. So it really depends on what you we're looking at. Thank you for your comment, though. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't see, I see 11 out of 15 say Colfax on it, and I don't see a mention of BRT in here at all. And I'm wondering how those two things go together, because we're getting ready to make a lot of stuff happen on Colfax. And so I, I want to be sure that this gets to that and vice versa. Yes, definitely. Good comment. As we work through these projects, definitely we'll be engaging BRT members and making sure that their improvements is in line with what we have. Absorb. Thank you so much for being here. And I really appreciate the partnership with CDOT and RTD and Dr. Cog on this really important issue. I think you've heard some some, feed, some comments about we really do need to focus on these. These are particularly vulnerable users of the system. They're, bicyclists and pedestrians are disproportionately represented in this region in terms of the share of fatal crashes that occur on our system uh, relative to their share of travel. So it is really a really important issue. A couple of, couple of quick questions on, on this on the system, net, on the network analysis piece that you did, I'm curious about the inclusion of the interstates on the map, um, since other than I think Pena, um, bicyclists and pedestrians are not allowed on the interstate system. So it's a little confusing to have the interstates on the map in terms of the risk analysis on the network. So I might suggest maybe, or I'd, I'd like to understand sort of the reasoning for including them on the map and the risk analysis from a, from a system standpoint um, versus sort of acknowledging that bikes and pedestrians aren't really there and maybe that maybe we should focus on the arterials where, where they do exist. Um, and then um, second, I, I'm, my second question is, you mentioned that um, CDOT didn't include sort of city and county of Denver parts of the state highway system because city and county of Denver was pursuing their own work sort of in parallel. And I, I noted sort of one project you're coordinating with city and county of Denver on, but I'm wondering if you are anticipating taking the next step and sort of integrating their work into this larger region one work in terms of the state highway network to think about prioritizing and taking the next steps to design and allocate state funding to improvements on state highways within the city and county of Denver, as well as all these other really important locations that have been identified. Right, definitely. Those, those are really good points. And um, uh, going to the first area, we're looking at the interstates as well. But we really didn't look into the line of the interstates, more of the, the ramp segments and the junctions um, where they might be areas where they'd be crossing over to get to the other side. Um, or they may be a parked vehicle outside and pedestrian can get hit in that uh, sense as well. So we probably need to dig a little bit deeper as far as specifics on the interstates, but they are considered, uh, they brought up as uh, bicycle and pedestrian crashes in the data. So, um, and then to your next uh, comment there, um, during we, when we have the study uh, in the process, when we did reach out to the city and county of Denver, they had similar effort, but we do have the data that's available to coordinate together and come up with uh, region-wide efforts in that manner as well. So that'll probably be the next steps looking at and just seeing where they are on their study as well. I think, I think that next step of coordinating and bringing the entire CDOT Region 1 system into sort of one list so we can prioritize and we can marshal our collective resources to focus on those priorities sort of regardless of where they are on the state highway system, whether they're in. And I don't want to bump anything, but we, we need to focus on the, the whole system, in my opinion. So, Christine. Yes, thank you. And, and thank you for the, um, the great information and presentation. Um, what really jumped out for me is, you know, when I, when I looked at the, the number of incidents, the number of crashes, it's more than one a day. So one person, one individual on average, or more than one a day are being impacted, whether it's just minor injury or even a fatality. And so that, that's really powerful. And just based on the, the, the data and the mapping, you know, the, 
it, it's obvious it's the crashes are occurring where the people are. You know, if, if people are on the streets, you know, for what, you know, whatever reason, it's retail, it's where they live. I, I think that's where, to me, the focus of mitigation ought to happen. We, you know, some of the, I know the CDOT is trying to be equitable and looking at more of the rural areas such as Bennett's, you know, for example. Um, but, but when you look at maybe the number of incidences in Bennett compared to, you know, that strip on Colfax, it's pretty minor. So don't want to play favorites here, but it, it seems that um, to, um, to Austin's point earlier, um, we just need to do something about the car. And the, the, I think the point on speed is really import, important. Enforcement is super important. I mean, we can do all the mitigation work, but if people are flying through, you know, the streets at, you know, over the speed limit, um, whatever that speed limit is, that's a real problem. And that's probably a, you know, a high likelihood of, um, you know, the reasons why there's there's so many incidents. I think there's also an onus that needs to be placed on the individual. You, you see jaywalking all the time on Colfax. People are dashing across the street because they don't want to walk a block to get to the corner. And, and that's really, um, you know, that, that that's frequent. And then also folks, um, you know, are, there, there could be many more opportunities for crosswalks. And I think those could be, and, and, and slowing the speeds by the crosswalks. What I see a lot of the mitigation are very expensive mitigation measures versus, hey, let's just get at the, at the speed issues and, and enforcement of what we already have. And I think that could make a big difference at, at a much lower cost. So just some comments. To, to I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Adams. Just a couple of observations, and I, I do apologize for being late, but I had a phone call outside. Uh, I think I get the essence of the conversation, but I do want to make one other observation about things as I see them, both in the downtown area and certainly outside. You know, our roads are getting more complicated as we are becoming more multimodal. And I know that even in my community, one of the things that I observe just for myself, even when I try and be the least distracted that I could possibly be, I do find that I've got to watch out for bike lanes that are in the middle of the street. I've got to watch out for people who are wearing clothing at night that is not necessarily reflective so that I can see them. I've got to worry about people doing the crosswalking that you're talking about. I don't know what the answer is. And God, don't even mention the distracted driving with cell phones and other things that people are doing. I don't know what the answer is, and I don't know from CDOT's perspective, because I think we all care greatly about 700 people losing their lives a year. And, and we've got to figure out a better way to get the message across, and it may be sort of one of those never-ending stories, how we get them out of the cars, how we get them less distracted. But it is something that is a solid interest of mine and I think of the other CDOT commissioners. Deal with safety. But, but it is complicated. And it has gotten more complicated, I think, over time. Commissioner Adams, I, I really appreciate those comments because they're, they're, they're absolutely correct. And I think what, what sometimes people miss is because we talk about vulnerable users on the system and trying to make the system safer for every, everybody. And, and the truth is the vast majority of sort of the corrections or the redesign of facilities to make facilities safer for bicycles and pedestrians are going to make the system safer for vehicles as well and drivers and passengers and vehicles. Um, speed is a huge contributor to the severity of crashes, whether that crash is between an automobile and a bicyclist or two automobiles. And so thinking about what the appropriate speed is by facility and the, and the kind of situation of that facility and thinking about how we design that facility to get to those issues helps for everybody. To, to your point, drivers being distracted is a, is a really key issue. And if we have sort of appropriate operating speeds for the vehicles on that facility, even if someone's a little distracted and they miss, a, they miss seeing a pedestrian, they have more reaction time to correct right, and less risk of a severe crash, with it, whether it's with a vehicle turning in front of them or a pedestrian stepping into the, into the really important issues.
I, I do give some of the auto manufacturers credit for this because I do have a vehicle that does an interesting thing. Some of you may have one that does this as well. But I have one that when I try and pull out of an intersection and there is a vehicle coming in the other direction, it will not let me move. I don't, you know, and, and there are some technologies that are being introduced by some of the manufacturers that I think we should continue to encourage because uh, there, there are things that are now built in some vehicles that really are safety initiatives. We might not like them, but they are really, they can be very, very helpful. And I do think they make a difference. Uh, Director Williams and Director Ward. Thank you, Austin. Hang on one second. Um, one more thing I want to point out. Our state demographer recently advised us all that there are now more older adults in our region than there are children. And um, based on Commissioner Adams' comments about having to be more cautious, not of the distraction in our hands, but of the distractions around us and some of us mentioning no names, don't have the same kind of reflexes that we used to have. So I just want to be sure that this group allows for that change in demographics. Thanks. Or that was that a comment at me or Cam? <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. One last question, and it's really more of a rhetorical question. How many at CDOT, when they do these types of um, designs and questionnaires and interpretation of data and even just anyone else in this room, how many of them actually use the bike and pedestrian infrastructure that currently exists? Because I think we have a tendency to want to make decisions even though we don't actually use that system. I mean, I, for me personally, I can answer, I try and bike and bus and walk as much as I can. And the same be said about everyone else in this room and everyone in CDOT. It's very challenging to make those decisions if you don't actually go out there and use it and see it for yourself and build it for what, what it would take to get more people to use it, not just what, what I am assuming for the data um, demographics. This particular situation is those that are more reliant on it because they have no other means. But it's just a rhetorical question. Everyone to consider. Yeah, uh, I, I guess we didn't really look into the number of folks using bike, bike facilities uh, when lo looking at the study itself. But good point that you, you brought up as well to, for us to consider that. I'll actually provide an extension to that, though. I think people that design things should have to use what they design because I think sometimes things are done with, with the best of intention and they don't necessarily play out that way. And so I, I, would, I would carry that out to the, to the other end of, of that as well. Um, two comments from me. Um, one is, and I've said this before, and this is the, the I guess, the get off my lawn guy in me, uh, predictability. And, and over time, predictability in, in these things has, has changed so much. With, with turn signals being at the front or at the end or sometimes at the front and sometimes at the end and, and, and the, the various things that we've done with, with separated or protected bike lanes. And I, I, I think that is something, especially as the population ages, is important for us to keep in mind is trying to be as predictable as we can with some of those changes because, because that will help. And then one editorial comment, uh, Commissioner Adams made reference to the, the technology and vehicles and how that helps. I will say I cringe every time I see the commercial for the autonomous vehicle where the people are clapping to the song as they're driving down the highway. What a terrible message that's sending about what that technology is about. Uh, just, I, I, just, I just cringe every time I see that. If you haven't seen the commercial, keep an eye out for it. Any final, sir, Mr. Welch. Yeah, thank you. Just two quick things to add. When CDOT, Dr. Cog, and RTD scoped out the regional bus rapid transit feasibility study, we recognized that every BRT project is a Vision Zero project. And the uh, FTA requires exhaustive uh, safety and security management planning. RTD does extensive preliminary hazard analyses of every single project, particularly bus rapid transit. The other thing I'll add is many, many may not know this, but 
Um, sadly, many, you know, these pedestrians, some of them are our customers that are, that are vulnerable. And one of the things that we do at RTD is we're contacted by CDOT or local municipalities whenever there is a pedestrian or bicycle incident that we think may have some relationship to the location of our bus stops. You know, we find this horrifying that people are dashing across the street um, and then get struck by a vehicle trying to get on transit. So it's a major, major emphasis at RTD, and we will continue to make it a high priority for us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak. I just want to add on to something Brian mentioned. Just recently, Secretary Buttigieg did a call for action. It's called the National um, Roadway um, uh, Safety Strategy. And there's more than 80 entities across the country that have joined this call as it relates to Allies for Action. RTD is one of those entities. We had disseminated information back regarding this in April, but I broached that as we talk about Vision Zero because there's a multitude of things that we are doing collectively um, in relationship to our contribution, recognizing that we don't have auspices over our arterials and things of the like. But to re-emphasize the point that Brian made, what we're doing is we're collecting GPS, you know, data sets that we can identify um, some areas and then intentionally adding to uh, training for our frontline um, uh, staff. And um, there's a multitude of other things we're examining because there is interest uh, from board members as it relates to uh, our contributions to Vision Zero. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to broach that. So if you're not aware of um, Secretary Buttigieg's call for um, action, I encourage you to go to um, DOT's website to learn about it because it's quite an undertaking and a multitude of entities ranging from Amazon to Uber uh, to AAA to transit agencies to uh, state DOTs and things of the like. So thank you for the opportunity to share that information. Uh, just a reminder, uh, this meeting is conducted in person. Uh, there are some folks watching online, but we don't have a mechanism for online participation in the conversation. So uh, we appreciate people observing, but we don't have the mechanism at this point for uh, virtual comments uh, beyond the public comment period of time. Any final comments from this group? Seeing none, thank you very much. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, we will move ahead to item number five, the statewide, statewide transit plan update. Cole Netter, Senior Transportation Planner, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's Senior Transit Planner. I'm here to introduce Brian Metzger, who's the Assistant Director of Transit Planning and Delivery for CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail. It's good? All right. <laughs> um, he's going to be giving a couple planning updates that are relevant to our coordinated transit planning work, including a, the bus staying expansion plan. If you guys remember in May 2023, there was an update on that, so he's going to be building on that with this presentation. And then also a couple transit plan updates and visioning processes um, having to do with the long range transit plan in 2024 and the inner city, inner city regional bus plan in 2023. Um, hey all, thank you for having me. Um, as Cole mentioned, my name is Brian Metzger. I'm the Assistant Director of Planning and Operations now. Um, we're actually gonna get in that a little bit. We've reorganized a little bit. Uh, uh, for CDOT and DTR, but uh, uh, wanted to, Dr. Cog asked me to come and, and give some updates on some of the things that we got going on. Some of you have seen some of these slides already. We, I think we talked to Dr. Cog a month or two ago, uh, so I think you've seen some of this stuff already, but uh, wanted to share it out with everybody else and kind of let you know what we got going on right now and what we got going on in the future. Uh, so just a quick agenda. We're going to go over uh, the DTR um, organization. So as I mentioned, we have uh, reorganized a bit. Uh, we have a new director on board, so I uh, wanted to introduce him. Uh, he's not here today, but introduce who he is. I think most of you know him, but uh, I'll go through that. Again, talk through the bus tank expansion plan a little bit. We did wrap that up here at the uh, middle of August or towards the end of August. And then what we got going on some, for some future planning. Uh, so apologize if this is a little bit small, but we are, we are getting quite large now um, within our organization. So at the very, very Top of this is Kay Kelly, who she sees our Chief of Innovation Mobility. Um, so DTR does fall within the um, Office of Innovation Mobility. 
Uh, Paul DeRocher, who is our new uh, director, he came on board at the end of July. So he's now getting his feet wet and, and drinking from the fire hose. That, that is uh, CDOT, DTR, and, and everything else involved in that. Uh, we've restructured a little bit. So we used to be, uh, when Amber was here, we used to have about five different uh, units within DTR. Um, we've consolidated a little bit, one to help with our FTE count, um, and then just, you know, the, the different resources that we need. Um, but all the way to your left is David Singer, who still runs our passenger rail stuff. Um, they're going to continue to do what they do. There's not much, doesn't need, need much explaining there, what they got going on um, and what they have uh, coming up in the future. Um, I'll go all the way to kind of to the right or to the middle is Jan Rowe, who is our assistant director of programs. So one of the big changes is uh, Jan has actually taken on a lot of our administration staff. So a lot of the, uh, so really what they're kind of doing is the pre-award and post-award now is really kind of focused on that. I really kind of, I like to tell everybody or to make it simple, Jan does everything with the FTA. I kind of do everything with, with the state funds and things like that when it comes to money and grants and that nature. Um, me kind of in the middle, uh, Brian Metzger, Assistant Director of Planning and Operations. Uh, so one of the big shifts there, so outside of the planning and delivery stuff that we were doing in, uh, previously, with all of our facilities, mobility hubs, transit centers, all those kinds of things like that, um, I've actually taken on uh, the bus operations. So I oversee all of our bus tank, uh, family services, and, and all those uh, all the stuff that's, that we got going on over there. The, the reorganization with that, or at least with my unit anyways, helps right we're doing all the planning we're doing all the delivery of all these facilities and helping oversee that so that connection of hey a bus has to stop here hey a bus is part of this plan all those kinds of things like that um that was really kind of the the whole idea behind this this reorganization um all the way over to your right um is the oim folks um they got three different units over there uh apologies like k k couldn't make it today uh but anyways, they're, they got everything going on over there from their ZEV and autonomous vehicles and electric charging and everything else like that. Um, but our, really our whole goal with kind of reorganizing and kind of refocusing on what OIM is as a whole is connecting all of us um, in one sh way, shape, or form, right? As we're putting in mobility hubs, how do we electrify those things? How do we make sure there's charging there or, or infrastructure for that? Um, Lily, on her end, um, when we do do mobility hubs or transit centers or any of those things like that, how do we make those micro, micro transit connections? How do we make those first and last mile connections? All those, really trying to integrate us all as a whole, one big unit. Uh, so as I mentioned, I want to talk through the bus tank expansion plan. Um, we did wrap this thing up uh, middle of August. Uh, obviously one thing that I inherited now as uh, <laughs> overseeing all of our, our bus tank family of services. Um, but really, the purpose of this bus tank service plan was to really evaluate the overall market potential. The plan to expand our routes and, and round trips and everything else that was kind of came up with was done, you know, pre-COVID. So post-COVID, we wanted to look and say, hey, do we actually have the demand to do this thing, to really expand most of our routes? Or well, I think the plan was to really double basically our round trips north, south, and west um, on, on our main lines, on I-25 and I-70 anyways. Um, answer to that is yes, right? The, the models and everything say that, that we, can, we can make this happen. Um, we really wanted to ensure the proposed service met the anticipated demand. As I mentioned, like I said, we wanted to make sure from what all the models, all the, all the everything that we were doing with this thing said that we were going to have the ridership to do it. Turns out, like I said, we, we really do. There's some routes on I-70 and even going up north, depending on the time of day. I mean, we're, we're almost having to have a, a, a bus follow behind because we're having so many people on, on some um, and ultimately, this plan is really going to help us develop that, that planning level ridership projections. Okay, what are we going to do in the next year, two years, to five years, and so on and so forth. Um, develop, help us develop really some schedules and timetables, right? Do we just need to shift some of these times around, right? And, and really, you know, looking at some of the timetables that we did get out of this study, said shift it 20 minutes one way or another, you're going to have a little bit more demand here. You're going to have a higher ridership here, all those kinds of things. Meet requirement and operating cost. Obviously, those are big things. Those are big challenges uh, across not just the state, but the, the nation. Um, how many buses do I need? I basically need to double my fleet um, over the next however many years to make all these routes happen. That's a big thing because procurement is a year, year and a half out. Uh, operating costs, again, having those operators to actually run all these routes, to have that number of, of drivers day in and day out, to not just do our bus tank family of services, but all the other little seasonal services and things like that, that we have available to the state. Um, so you see we got a little timetable there to the bottom uh, right-hand corner. 
Um, really, we started out with that existing conditions. What plans do we have? What information do we have? Worked with DTD quite a bit on some of their demand modeling and things like that. They're, they're real, all the PhD that Eric has. <laughs> they're, they're really, really smart people to run these models and things like that. Uh, got into our travel market analysis, so really kind of went out to the field, did some surveys, had a huge turnout on surveys, actually going to continue some of the surveys and some of the different things that, that we got uh, on board. And then really, like I said, our recommendations and next steps. So really the next steps for this thing is actually I'm sitting down today for about two hours with our operator and saying, what is our plan? How are we going to actually accomplish this thing moving forward over the next year, two years? And so hopefully in the next couple couple months, I have a little bit more information for everybody about like when we're going to start seeing some of these shifts and, and what we're going to do available for everybody. Uh, so some future planning. So these are, are really big things. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, go out of order a little bit on, on my bullet points, but kind of the third bullet point down that bus tank expansion plan, that was kind of our first little thing to do, right? We're really focusing on our I-70 and I-25 corridors. Like I said, really uh, just basically said, what, what, what are we going to do here? What, what's ridership? How are we going to do this with our operating cost? How are we, what kind of fleet do we need? All the stuff I really mentioned. All that's going to flow right up into our inner city and regional bus plan. Uh, so hopefully going to kick that off here actually in the next month or two, really um, just working on the final uh, uh, final little bit of the scope and, and what we want to do with this thing, what deliverables we want to have. But really our inner city and regional plan is going to be our network planning. What are all the branches that come off I-25 and I-70? How do we make those connections? How do we make, um, you know, the, with all of our outriders and, and all our lo local agencies and how do we fill in all those gaps? You know, we hear all the time, oh, well, what about this corridor? Or what about that corridor? Um, things like that. We've heard, you know, with I-270 getting redone, right? Let's look at I-270, US-34, all these other corridors that really don't have much transit in there. Let's go and look at them. Let's see what we can do. What money do we need? What kind of funding? What, what kind of schedule do we need? These included. Um, and then the big one uh, next spring is going to be our long range transit plan. We'll be working very closely with Darius and his team with that. Uh, one of the things we want to do is is try to basically uh, not, not duplicate efforts, but we want to we want to make sure we're working in conjunction with them, right? We don't want to have two different engagement. We don't have to come here for, or you don't all don't want to have to come here for two hours and talk with Darius and his team from an engagement, right? And then turn around and come and have DDR come in and do anything from there. So we're going to work very closely. We've already started meeting. Um, probably not really going to kick this thing off till what, May of 2024, I think is what we're looking at right now, um, but already sitting down like, hey, how are we going to communicate? How are we going to engage? How are we going to do all this stuff? How are we going to contract? Um, everything that needs to go on with that. But really, like I said, the long-range plan is, 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 is what it is. I mean, you all know kind of what a long-range plan is. Um, it's inclusive of all of our plans. Really, it's going to be our project-based, that project list of kind of like, okay, what are we going to do um, in the future? Um, one of the big things with all these plans that I'm putting in all the scopes and all the things and really putting on my, all my folks is that what are, the, what are our metrics? What are our KPIs, right? What are we going to do over the next year? What are we going to do over the next two years? What are we going to do over the next five years? Are we meeting those goals? What's our baseline to really measure against? Are we actually meeting this plan? I don't think at least the, the previous one, the 2045 plan, didn't give us a lot of those things, and so we're going to put a lot of that stuff um, at the forefront, that way you know, hey, here's here's what we're doing, here's what we're bringing to the table. Um, we're either meeting it or not meeting it. If we're not meeting it, here's what we're doing to negate it better. That's all I got. Like I said, not 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 a, not a ton today for me. Uh, more more to come, that's for sure. Over the next questions, comments, Mr. Ward. Thank you, Chair. Um, quick questions on Mustang. Um, it seems to be daily now that I get at least one, if not more than one, notification on the West Line in particular being delays, cancellations, and by delays, I mean hours long delays. What is CDOT doing to address that, that issue? I mean, if you continue to keep delaying buses, you're not going to continue to keep ridership. Yeah. We'll always find some other alternative. Definitely. Uh, so definitely a, a major, major point of emphasis. Like I said, I'm actually meeting with the operator today uh, to start kind of identifying what our plan is. One of the things we're going to do, uh, we're, we're starting to look at our seasonal services. So we have like a bus tank to Estes. Um, 
other Rams routes and other things like that. We're actually going to cut some of those things down. There's just the ridership's not there on a lot of them anyways already. So let's cut those things down to help with our operator shortage and make sure that they have the hours because I think they can run up like 70 hours a week or something like that, I think is what the, the – anyways, try to get some of those hours back, try to get some of those things back. Um, there's also some other lines that we have that are our main lines, are I-25 and I-70, that run on a daily basis throughout the week that we're going to look to potentially cut those things just because, again, they're getting – a route like it's not it's not it's not benefiting anybody it's not not revenue or anything like that um, one of the things our operator actually did was increase their, their on their drivers and so they put back out hey um, we're increasing our wages to try to recruit some more people that takes some time to get them in I think it's 60 days through it uh, getting them on board and then training and things like that so we should start seeing some of that stuff like that, um, as well as we're doing some things on our end as well from a CDOT standpoint um, within my marketing budget is, is out there to help help our operators recruit folks, um, as well as looking into a CDL program. So one of the things our maintenance folks did, uh, I think it was last year or two years ago, they started actually having a, a CDL training program available to anybody where basically they bring them in, train them, get them the CDL, but they have to sign a contract like, hey, you have to work for us for a year or whatever it is. I don't know the, the, all the, the requirements around it, but anyways, do something very similar to that. And we, we go out to the KOA building and have a, have a place where they can train and do all the stuff. They have to sign a contract that they're going to work for the operator and just help out as much as we can there. So looking at a bunch of different things like that um, to help, hopefully help alleviate some of those shortages. Um, but the biggest thing is, is, is just that operator shortage. What about the delays? That, that will that will help with the delay. So a lot of the delays are coming because either people are calling off sick, like last minute. They're calling up, at, you know, at seven o'clock this morning when they have to leave at seven thirty, and then they have to, it just takes a little bit to get a get an operator in, and that'll help. Or they have folks on standby if they have a, a more of an operator. I referenced I seventy in particular on that one because. For some reason, CDOT feels the need to send every single bus practically to Grand Junction. <laughs> um, and you run the risk of having uh, closures in Glenwood yeah. Canyon. And those are the delays I'm referencing where you have to deep bus up through Craig, which adds an extra four hours to the trip. Is CDOT looking at potentially just cutting, let's say, half those buses back to Avon and Vale, where most of your riders are getting off at first? Yep. Uh, yeah. So our biggest our biggest stop is Glenwood Springs. One of the things we're actually looking to do is split route I-70 and say, and basically we'd have a handful of buses that only go the two hours from Glenwood Springs or whatever to Grand Junction. Other ones coming back. So again, we'll do that with our operator to see what we can do. That. You kind of glossed over the, um, or very quickly went over, I should say, the passenger rail oh. uh, aspect. Um, what exactly does that entail? I mean, obviously we have the Front Range Passenger Rail District, but they're theoretically a separate entity that has been working very closely with them to provide some of the technical and um, just employee matters to get running. Is there future expansions that CDOT is planning as it relates to passenger rail across the state, or was that just something you referenced to the Front Range Passenger Rail? I just I referenced it just because I know it's going on. <laughs> it's going to be a part of that, right? Um, and those connections, some of the stuff David Singer and his group are looking at, right? When we're putting on the mobility hub at Castle Rock and some of these other places, they're looking to how the passenger rail can actually connect there. That's really to the extent that I have much knowledge about it, but um, uh, well, I, I don't have a ton of information on that. Okay, thank you. Turn that up. Just to. Uh, Comment. I, I wasn't familiar with the three or four hour delays on uh, busting, but I assure you, and now that I am, I'll, I'll take a lot of interest in it. But on the subject of resources, you know, and why you could have delays, one, I would say within all of CDOT, you know, getting your snow removed during the winter months and having drivers to do that, having CDL drivers is a real challenge for us. And it is a challenge for everybody in the country, all over the country, every place that I go and talk to people about resources. I suspect Deborah's nodding, so I suspect even at <laughs> RTD, getting drivers and getting qualified people who are going to drive properly, safely, is a, is a challenge. 
And so, you know, I think we have to work harder so that we don't have these delays that are creating problems. And uh, I assure you, I'll ask the question and whatever help I can provide, I'm happy to provide it because we don't want people resorting to going back to the vehicles when we've spent so much effort trying to get them to use busting. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. It is very helpful to know that, but I can assure you we'll, we'll try and help. So anything I can do in that regard, please let me know. More money. <laughs> Dr. Williams. I just want to let everybody know that I just came back from the state transit conference last week in Crested Butte, and uh, there was a lot of people there that are really happy with Bustang. The rural communities have really, it's made a difference to what they can do and where they can go, and I didn't hear any complaints, so I wanted to give you that. And I, Brian, I've got to make a brief reference. You you referred to the KOA building. Uh, one of the things in my world is I'm president of a group that preserves the history of radio and TV in Colorado. And that building, uh, I love the fact that it hasn't been KOA for 80 or 90 years, but it's still referred to the KOA building out on, on Colfax, their old studios from back in the day. And it's cool that uh, CDOT still has that building and yeah. it still refers to it that way. So yeah. thank right. you. Final comments? Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. With that, we will move ahead to item number six, Regional Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan. Callie Fallon, Emerging Mobility and Transportation Demand Management Planner. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kaylee Fallon. Um, I am the Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner here at Dr. Cog in our Active and Emerging Mobility Program, here to give you an update on our Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan, where we are in the planning process, and then open up the floor for questions and comments. Um, so just a quick recap on what the regional um, TDM strategic plan is, why we're doing this, why now. Um, essentially, this plan is an overhaul to Dr. Cog's short-range TDM plan that was published in 2012, recognizing that our world is vastly different. Um, we have changes in technology. We have changes in travel behavior. Our region looks different. Our population looks different. So we are um, essentially overhauling the 2012 short-range TDM plan um, and, and making sure that we are incorporating um, those changes and expanding our definition of a TDM. So historically, Dr. Cog as an agency has really focused on the marketing, education, and outreach components of TDM, um, but this plan really looks to expand that and incorporate policies, infrastructure, the whole suite of TDM strategies. Um, so this plan will really support mobility services throughout our region, um, and it has been identified in our 2022 to 2023 UPWP. So scope of work outline and where we are right now in the planning process, um, we have completed tasks one through three, and we are currently on tasks four and five. That, um, that is the TDM toolkit, as well as those recommendations and plan preparation. Here's an overview of the timeline. Um, as you can see here in September, um, this one is it's a little bit outdated, but um, we'll be going out for public comment actually in October. So um, you can ignore that September block, um, but we are wrapping up um, Dr. Cog internal staff edits to the plan recommendations and toolkit, and then we'll be going out to public comment on October 2nd, like I mentioned, and then looking ahead, we'll be bringing um, the plan back to TAC in November and then for RTC and board approval in December. Um, so a quick recap of the um, stakeholder engagement that we've done to date. Um, we've hosted five stakeholder steering committee workshops. Um, the stakeholder steering committee, again, is that core group of TDM folks and par um, partners within the region. So that's CDOT, our TMA partners, um, the folks who are really working day in, day out on TDM. And then we also have had two workshops with our regional TDM consortium completed. Um, these are the folks that work in um, TDM adjacent 
um, work. So our equity folks, our bids, our economic folks, um, those are kind of the, the larger group of um, folks who work um, in areas that are definitely important and related to TDM work. Um, and then in addition to those groups, we have held focus groups and interviews um, with some of those folks from the consortium and some um, additional folks. So those focus groups included large employers, land use and developers, mobility operators, um, and economic development and business improvement districts. Um, and then we have also had CDOT and TMA individual workshops where um, staffers from those agencies reviewed the draft recommendations and toolkit. So just wanted to go through the draft recommendations that we have come up in this plan and get um, some feedback from you all. So these draft recommendations were created through um, that stakeholder engagement process that I just touched on, as well as our consultant-led research. Um, they did existing conditions analysis, they did an equity analysis, um, they did an ROI analysis. So really just combining the stakeholder engagement with our um, consultant research, that is how we got to these um, draft recommendations. So the recommendations, there's a total of 10 of them, and they fall into one of these three categories. There are planning recommendations, policy recommendations, and then services. So the three planning, there are three planning recommendations. Um, the first one is to prepare a white paper that explores ways to fund TDM incentive programs. We heard a lot from our stakeholder engagement that incentives are very, very hard to fund, but they're so important in the TDM world. Um, the second planning recommendation is to explore, support and expand safe routes to school programs across the region. And then the third one um, is to establish a TDM technical assistance program um, for member governments and TDM partners to support. So that would be, um, you know, touching on the fact that Dr. Cog does provide technical assistance to member governments and TDM. This is really kind of formalizing that and making that um, an official technical assistance program. And then there are three policy recommendations. Um, so these are policies for Dr. Cog to consider. Um, the first one is consider integrating TDM as a requirement for certain TIP projects um, that has yet to be flushed out, but just very broadly. The second one is to explore opportunities to reduce or remove the local match requirement for TDM projects that benefit marginalized communities. Again, we heard a lot through our stakeholder engagement and outreach that that local match requirement can be a barrier um, for marginalized communities and historically underserved communities to um, apply for grant opportunities and to carry out those projects. And then the third policy recommendation is to revise the TDM set aside scoring criteria as they relate to equity and innovation. So just a little bit more on that TDM set aside scoring criteria right now. Um, it is kind of vague on the way that it is worded. So this is just going into more um, how we would reword and kind of restructure the equity criteria. Um, I, I believe right now it's just as defined as an EJ area, but recognizing um, that there are communities that aren't spatially, um, spatially grouped um, that this TDM set aside could serve. So kind of looking to expand our definitions of equity and what an EJ community is. Um, and then adjusting the innovation criteria so that we are not limiting really successful projects to be um, replicated in other areas of the region. And then finally, there are four recommendations that fall under the TDM services category. The first one is enhanced mobility on demand assistance for member governments. Again, Dr. Cog is already somewhat doing this, but this would be formalizing that kind of assistance program. Um, the second one relates to our way to go partnership and our TMA partnership. That would be collaboratively develop and share an annual work plan. And then go, kind of going off that, the third one is broadening the focus of way to go to include all trips. Um, traditionally, way to go has really focused on those nine to five commuters, those, those peak commute hours. And so how can we um, broaden the scope of way to go to focus on all trips, especially considering um, a post pandemic world where travel behaviors have changed. So we have lots of folks in the region now um, telecommuting and, and um, now traveling at, at lunch and off peak hours. And then the fourth one is expand ways that Dr. Cog can better understand results delivered by TDM programs 
Um, this is including developing new tools, data collection method. Again, from stakeholder outreach in particular, we are TMAs. We've heard a lot about how hard it is to kind of prove the benefits of TDM. Um, so, so that one is um, coming from the stakeholder engagement and feedback we got there. So those recommendations will be included in the final plan or as a part of the plan. And then as a separate document, we've also developed a um, toolkit. And so the toolkit is really supposed to be a broad resource for TDM practitioners, partners, member governments in the region, anyone looking to implement TDM strategies in their planning processes and in their um, development process. So this um, toolkit kind of lives as a separate document, um, but just wanted to go through the draft toolkit strategies with you all as well. Um, so there are a total of 31 TDM strategies. Of course, these are subject to evolve as, um, as we as a region evolve, as technology evolves, um, but for now there are 31 strategies and they fall into seven general categories. Um, so these are the categories that they fall under. We have transportation, technology, services, infrastructure, parking management, incentives and subsidies, roadway management, policies and ordinances, as well as the traditional education outreach and marketing. So won't go through all 31 um, draft toolkit strategies. You should have a copy of those in your packet. I know they are kind of small and hard to read here on the screen, but um, just kind of highlighting some examples of the toolkit strategies. We have um, things such as microtransit and micromobility. Obviously, those types of programs have gained um, lots of popularity in the past couple of years, especially with COVID. Um, and we have continued to see micromobility programs throughout the region grow, so really focusing on those. Um, also, strategies such as active transportation, travel ways, bus rapid transit, no, we just kind of touched on that, um, parking management, curbside management strategies, rebates and incentives for e-bikes. I know that those programs are wildly popular in the city and county of Denver, as well as Boulder and other um, local municipalities throughout the region. Um, so really, again, this toolkit is um, intended to be a broad resource for any TDM practitioner or planner looking to implement strategies within their work um, and Within the toolkit, each strategy will include a specific description, um, and then it will also include what we're now calling context guide. Um, so you'll be able to kind of look at the context or the land use of um, your area or your local jurisdiction and see which TDM strategies are most applicable um, depending on the land use, transit access audience, things of those nature. Um, each toolkit strategy will also have an equity methodology and equity considerations, um, as well as additional case studies and resources. So looking ahead, as I mentioned right now, we are doing a um, Dr. Cog internal staff review of the recommendations and toolkit strategies. Um, and then in just about two weeks, we will open up for public comment um, on social pinpoint. So that will be online, a virtual open house. We will be um, getting the word out through social media and e-blast. And then um, the public will have about 29, 30 days to comment on the draft plan. Um, and then we will be taking it through um, TAC to you all again, and then to the board in December for final approval and adoption. So really just right around the corner, we are almost at the finish line, um, but really wanted to open up the floor for questions and comments that you all might have um, regarding any draft recommendations or toolkit strategies. Dr. Williams. I just want to be sure that your safe route to schools includes um, that all students can ride the public transportation network for free. That uh, should be a big part of that. Thank you. Director Ward. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question in the, t in the uh, 31 draft toolkit strategies, you have mentioned um, under the TDM supportive infrastructure, it says transit service, and that is referencing BRT, fixed route, and on demand. Can you elaborate a little more as to what does that toolkit strategy entail? Yeah, so I would say since the toolkit is intended to be a resource for local member governments, such as Broomfield or um, planners, practitioners, developers, um, I believe that toolkit will really be highlighting case studies in terms of um, 
collaborating with services, with public transit services. Um, I believe we have like a case study there about Boulder's hop service. So that's um, a public transit service that Boulder provides. I believe via mobility is the um, operator service, but that'll kind of touch on how, how local governments can expand and support public transit services. Um, I believe there'll be some overlap with the micro transit services. So how can local municipalities um, launch, pilot launch micro transit services to connect in with those public transit um, routes? We are seeing a lot of local governments kind of pilot those projects and that's really exciting. Um, so I think it'll be really kind of touching on what can local member governments do in order to expand and support um, bus rapid transit, public transit services. Um, and I, I think that answered your question, but okay. happy to. Um, the only reason I bring that up is Money is the big problem. I mean, are we, I know, we know RTD does not have enough funding for its size and what it's asked to do. The local government budgets are strained. County of Broomfield, uh, where I reside. Um, and we've done a lot on, as much as we can so far on our end in terms of land use and stuff like that around certain areas, but I mean, at the end of the day, if there's not enough money, I don't care if there's a toolkit that says, oh, we, you have a BRT line there. If they can't get to where they need to go, because where they need to go is, let's say, at two miles from US 36 and Broomfield Station in a reasonable amount of time, they're not going to use transit. And I would have liked to have seen an emphasis, particularly as it relates to TDM in terms of funding. I mean, you can, have all this, you can have all this marketing in the world. If they cannot reliably, effectively, and efficiently use public transit in combination with walking and biking, they're not going to be able, they're not going to pick it. Um, that comes down to money. You need money for the operators. You need money for their wages, for the buses, to run the service. I know that quite well being an RTD operator myself. And I just wish that would have been brought up. Director, what I really appreciate the comments because you're 100% you're correct. Um, I think it's also important to understand that the TDM, the regional TDM plan is just that. It, it is really trying to identify those tools that are available to help us address sort of our goals around travel demand management as a region. We have lots of plans and lots of goals and lots of strategies around expanding the pie and making and expanding funding for our full spectrum of transportation services, including transit. And probably airing it sort of for lack of a better word, in the TDM plan probably isn't the place to highlight that need and pursue the goals of expanding resources for expanding transit service and transportation services in general across the region. I, I want to assure you that that is, that is a significant issue for the region, are identifying and pursuing those additional or those services as well. And, but we, we should, in my opinion, continue to emphasize that transit services, whether they're fixed route services provided by RTD or if they're local flex ride services provided by local government, is a, an important component of our overall overall TDM goals and strategy. And I, and I appreciate that we, everyone in this room continues to go after those dollars to increase funding for public transit. But when I look at it from my non government brain, non someone who transit as much as possible, is you keep marketing all of this stuff and yet it's not there. You, want, you have this toolkit saying here you can use public transit to get from, let's say, Broomfield to downtown Denver, Broomfield to downtown Boulder, but at the end of the day, great, but I can't access it reasonably, reliably, and I, I just think part of that conversation or part of the marketing, marketing, but um, needs to emphasize that 
are looking at additional resources to increase this funding because when some <laughs> when someone looks at it who's just the public just just the public and is not part of these conversations in this room does not work for public transit authorities does not work for a local government um, they don't see what you have brought up that's not what they see and I level that expectation with them question comments being none thank you very much appreciate you being here thank you that we will move ahead to item number seven, Front Range Passenger Rail District Board Update. Jacob Brigger, Manager of Multimodal Transportation Planning. Jacob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. We actually had the perfect segue two items ago when Front Range Rail was mentioned. As it turns out, we very much want to give you an update on Front Range Passenger Rail. So just a little bit of background. Um, all of the agencies, and particularly Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, um, have been involved in Front Range Rail planning for a number of years. Um, previously on the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission, now with the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, Director Mulvey from Dr. Cog, who I believe is on the phone, um, who is one of the directors representing Dr. Cog on the new district board. Also want to acknowledge um, GM CEO Johnson, um, who is an ex officio member representing RTD um, on the district board as well. So uh, with this relatively new um, district board and the work that they've been doing over the, about the past year or so, uh, wanted to uh, fill you in on the work done to date um, and really some exciting things coming up um, in their work to advance um, the planning and project development for Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Chrissy Bright of District Board staff to give you an update. Chrissy? And Jacob, oh wow, it magically senses you talking. This is really an upgrade from previous Dr. Cog presentations. Uh, it's great to see you all today. I know many of you have heard me talk many times recently, so um, feel free to enjoy a texting break during some similar um, content. But it's great to see you all. I'm gonna start my presentation, like probably the majority of Dr. Cog presentations, that just speaks to the context that we're all planning and living in, right? The challenges of being in a growing region with, um, and what that does for our transportation systems, whether that be added congestion to our roadways, notably I-25, challenges with traffic safety, and then just knowing that we're in a state with winter and what happens to the roadways in winter and how that impedes travel time and congestion challenges. And just recognizing that as our state grows and gets 3 million new people in the front range between 2020 and 2050, we need new transportation options that can better absorb this growth and these um, people need to get where they need to go. So front range passenger rail is, just to help to have a kind of common definition, we're talking about something. It's a new inner city train service. It's a proposal for that. And I'm gonna keep using the term inner city and explain it a little more as it's an important distinction to make. Um, our initial service we're looking at is from Pueblo down through Denver, or up through Denver to Fort Collins. Um, we have a long-term vision of connecting the service to New Mexico and Wyoming. A distinctive feature of Front Range Passenger Rail is we're looking to use existing freight tracks, um, which will help us to minimize the startup cost and help us get the service going sooner than later. As I mentioned, the inner city rail term. So um, those of us that are primarily from and lived in Colorado, we obviously know commuter rail from RTD. And I think a big part of our public outreach and our stakeholder outreach in this effort is just explaining and educating on inner city rail. That's a service that stops far less frequently. Typically more stations are about every 20 to 30 miles. That means the trains can go faster between stations um, because they're not stopping. The, the trips are, the, the time to get from place to place is faster because they don't have to stop as often. Um, and then also the trains will have more onboard amenities like Wi-Fi, um, tables to work at, restrooms, um, food service, things like that. So um, we are partnering with RTD throughout this effort, but it's a different kind of train that we're looking to provide. Jacob did a really nice job succinctly talking about the history of planning to date, um, and I'm going to say it in a longer way. But um, it's really funny for me to try to have to define when planning for passenger rail in the front range started. Um, recently, I was told that as far back as 1982, Amtrak had some maps that had this corridor on it. And so um, I say it's been, you know, 15, 20 years of planning, but probably far more than that. 
Um, that said, though, going back to about 2010, there was some kind of visionary planning studies done in the region that looked at things like um, high-speed rail and kind of new greenfield sites and what would it take to do that kind of rail system. Um, in a similar time period in 2014, the Southwest Chief Coalition came together um, because Amtrak was looking to reroute the long-distance Southwest Chief Service that uh, was going and currently goes through Southern Colorado to bypass the state entirely. So legislators from Kansas and Colorado came together to preserve that service in the southern part of our state. The efforts to save the chief and these more visionary planning studies led to the creation of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. As Jacob mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Cog had a seat at that table and helped kind of shape our current where we're at today. Um, that commission put together an alternatives analysis in 2020, and through that alternatives analysis, um, it had essentially three recommended routes to look forward, um, to pursue forward, with generally the, the takeaway that these are all three good choices, but perhaps the best one would be using the existing BNSF freight line north of Denver that follows the Northwest Rail route, um, and again, just trying to use existing freight right-of-way and freight tracks as opposed to building a brand new greenfield system. Um, from that 2020 alternatives analysis, CDOT and the Front Range, or in the Southwest Chief Front Range Passenger Rail Commission, um, got a grant from the Federal Railroad Administration to make a true service development plan, and that's the work that's happening right now. Um, so the the service development plan grant was procured. It's it's happening, and, and shortly thereafter, the district was created through state legislation. And I will explain what the district is momentarily. So what is this district? Um, we are a new special district that was created by the Colorado Legislature in 2021. We're the largest special district in the state of Colorado, and we are essentially the successor organization to that rail commission that I was speaking of. Um, there we go. So as J Jacob mentioned earlier, we have a 24 person board of directors. Um, some of them are ex officio, like General Manager Johnson. So we have RTD, CDOT, the freight railroads um, as ex officio members. And then we have 17 voting members, mostly comprised of um, MPO, TPR appointments throughout the front range area. And then we have a few that are also six government appointments, governor appointments. You'll note that the district boundary is kind of that sky blue area and it extends along I-25 from um, the New Mexico to Wyoming border. It encompasses the entirety or portions of the 13 counties that um, span I-25. And so what is the district? The district is a new government that's essentially created really to bring passenger rail to Colorado. So it has the powers and the authority and the directive to finance, design, construct, and operate a passenger rail system along the front range. Um, in order to do that, the district has the power to levy taxes following voter approval, and we also can do things like create station improvement districts to work with local communities to create um, stations. So I think I just probably like most presentations you hear also want to speak to how important this time is and how special this moment is for us right now. We have 15 years of advocacy and of planning of kind of making a more concrete vision of that first service. Um, the district is established, which is a powerful governance tool to actually make this happen in terms of the ability to raise the funds, to enter into the contracts with operators, and to really oversee the system. Um, we're fortunate to have a strong state support from our governor who is really cares passionately about this project. And then, of course, with IIJA, there are now um, billions of dollars in new resources that didn't previously exist just, you know, two years ago. So I want to give a little more update at where we're at today and then ideally take questions. So as I mentioned today, we're doing our service development plan, which CDOT is doing for the district. Uh, it began in late 2022 and is expected to conclude in about a year. What it does is it kind of makes the business case for this service and it looks at, um, you know, the route, it looks at frequency, schedule, and how much it will cost to make that first service and essentially the implementation plan to starting up. Um, initial rail service. Also, um, so we have applied the district has to part of the quarter identification and development program. It's an FRA program that is created purely to kind of build out and facilitate the development of new passenger rail corridors across the United States. Um, we applied in March and probably like many uh, IIJA programs, they're taking a little long to um, announce the acceptance. It's going to look like it's probably going to be in November. But um, when we're accepted, we'll be eligible for initially $500,000 off the bat, and then moving forward, 
um, federal match opportunities of 90-10, so 90 federal, 10 local match. So really incredible opportunities to um, get significant federal funding to help build this throughout Colorado. So I share this slide just to note that um, we have done a lot of work and there's a lot of work ahead. So right, we've, we've done some feasibility studies, we've established the governance structure, we have done some service planning. The next big things ahead of us are looking at financing and figuring out you know, how much money do we need to raise and how best do we put together tax funding, um, various kinds of you know, loans and financing programs to, to actually pay for this. Um, NEPA is still ahead of us, and then also, of course, in its construction, opening day service, and as all, if all things go well, it's you know expanded routes and frequencies. We're really focused on defining that first route and that first service, and starting more conservatively with the having a, kind of our best first step, and then from there moving forward and expanding routes and frequencies as the system grows. Okay, the next slide is the fun one and the one I'm planning up the most questions about. Um, we, as a district, kind of right now in district staff, see some strengths to having a four-year plan going to the ballot for the vote. We recognize just how many steps are needed to have a strong ballot measure and to have our planning um, strongly worked out. And so we're looking likely at probably the 2026 as sort of the big, the big ballot ask. All that said, it's still very much um, being defined and we recognize the importance of seizing the opportunities at this current moment, especially in terms of um, strong state support and the IAJA funding. So um, we really wanted to share this slide to give a sense of kind of the many steps that have to happen in terms to go to the ballot and have successful initiative. Some of those things, of course, is finishing our service plan. Um, it's really figuring out those costs and making sure we have our costs and our financing down. Um, and then, of course, working through some of the local government outreach, making sure that our communities, this plan represents their needs and reflects the vision for their, for their um, locales. Of course, working with the freight railroads to make sure that the plan we bring forth also is, you know, vetted by them and that they endorse the plan or, you know, they agree with the plan. Um, and then also looking at areas where we have some parallel projects with RTD and, and determining kind of how we want to jointly coordinate those projects. So I'm going to pause there. Normally I have more slides, but I decided to do a lighter touch this morning. Happy to take any questions or have any sort of conversation. Director Williams. Um, can you tell me what percent of the population lives within the taxation district? I should be able to tell you that. Um, I, I can't. I don't want to give you the wrong number. I have one in my head, but I, I'm not sure it's correct. But um, I can find that and get back to you. I'm just wondering, since it's not the whole state, Correct. so this is not a statewide project. Exactly. It's not a statewide project. Similar to RTD that has its own taxing boundary, ours is that blue as well, because we recognize that people living on the, you know, the, eastern, the east, eastern plains and western slope wouldn't have the same benefit of the service as those living closer to I-25. I get all that. So, um, okay. And then do you know how many square miles that district is? I don't, but I'm, I'm loving these questions. I don't, I, I, I can find that for you as well. So there's proposed in 2026 a tax to support a district of so many square miles and so many people, even though it's not statewide, right? Correct. Thank you. Thanks. We're, we're all we're all deciding sort of who's going to go first with questions. I was waiting for my Austin Ward question, so I'm surprised <laughs> you beat him to it. But I'm, I'm waiting for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you again so much for being here. It's obviously a really really important topic for the state and the region. I w I'm looking forward to sort of. Uh, having you come forward with more of a concrete financing plan for putting Absolutely. this together. Because I, I think following on Director Williams' questions, I think obviously I think we, we all appreciate that this is a high priority for the governor and the state. Um, and and I, think, I think one question I might have is, will there be some analysis in terms of and some assessment of putting together the finance plan that acknowledges that even even those folks that live outside of the specific district boundaries that are somewhat tightly drawn in some areas, that if it's a state priority, if it's a state facility, if it's part of a larger state system that has statewide benefit, maybe in addition to just taxing the folks within the specific district boundary, that maybe there's a role for statewide funding to help 
as part of the funding strategy for the project, right? And certainly maybe it's not the majority, but it's, you know, ought to be at least considered to, to supplement the potential district funding. My other question was about the quarter identification program that you identified. I think it's a new program under, under the bill, so we don't exactly know how it's going to be administered by FRA, but I think we all have good experience with the capital investment grant program through FTA, where technically it's 80-20, it's right, for CIG. No transit agency ever gets 80-20 funding out of the CIG, and I, I would suspect that, and I would encourage you to think about the fact that it's unlikely for this FRA program to provide 90-10 funding, and I, wouldn't, I would encourage you not to bank on getting 90% federal funds through that program. Yeah, those were a lot of really good points, and I'm going to try to respond to the three that I best remember. Um, so firstly, I guess one thing I didn't perhaps highlight as well as I could have is this effort is by no means new, and it's very much underway, and it's incredibly important, and yet the district as an organization just had our one-year anniversary. So I wish we were as caught up administratively as we should be and could be. Um, we did last week, actually, um, this time last week, um, we had a pre-proposal meeting, so we're developing a consultant bench, and one of the first things we're going to work on is so the financial modeling and the fiscal analysis and making a map that has numbers in it so I can get you answers to very important questions, because absolutely. Um, to your point about kind of state funding and state support, also absolutely. This is a partnership, and if it's a priority for our state, we need to have partnership. And definitely, again, part of why we have this, I think, perhaps longer-term not, well, we want to be slower in terms of how we go to the ballots because we want to see what we can maximize in terms of state partnerships and federal partnerships before we go to a voter ask. And I appreciate your, your feeling that we need strong state support. Um, and then to your third point about um, what, what, what uh, the federal government advertises and what, what is actually delivered, very much heard. And I think it's also funny. I mean, it's not funny. It's really sad. But, um, you know, I'm constantly getting advocacy emails about, you know, this much money was identified for passenger rail, and of course, actual house appropriations versus what's identified is a very different story. But yes, it will take all these funding sources working together and all of us putting our best foot forward and a little bit of prayer at the end of the day. Yeah, I appreciate you raising that. Thanks. And then the Austin Ward question. I was, well, we're, we're going in order, it looks like. <laughs> Uh, house appropriations. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I actually had a question about design speeds in the corridor yep. and, and what is currently being proposed. Great question. I believe we're looking at a max speed of about 80. Yeah, I, that hasn't been formally formalized, but that's about what we're looking at. Dr. Ward. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, Chris is going to be sick of me by the time we get to the ballot measure. I think this is my seventh or eighth presentation from you or I know I feel bad for you <laughs> I could probably give the presentation just your place you and Jacob could definitely uh, <laughs> um, I guess one of my first questions is um, as you're identifying the funding structure and getting ready for 2026 ballot initiative we'll just say sure. on the timeline are you also looking at deep bruising I know that's been a one of the conversation RTD has been having to a degree, um, is that something that this district is going to be looking at just right off the bat, debrucing? So that's a fabulous question, and I will admit that before seven months ago, I didn't even know that term. So I know that that is in consideration, but I, that, that's, I'm not the best person to answer that question, but I know that we are thinking and assessing those kind of issues. Okay. Um, and then my next question is, I know there in the past have been conversations about when it does come time to ask the voters um, for approval through a tax, there have been conversations about maybe subdividing the district further. Have those conversations continued or have you determined whether or not that is possible? I don't know how many other presentations you have given to other groups that I am not part of, but I know when um, you guys were up at NADA, for example, there was hesitation at best from communities like Westminster and Brighton uh, and other portions of Adams County, Thornton, um, about adding on another 
tax, whether that be sales tax, mill levy, whatever the case may be, when unfortunately we have historically not seen delivery because of mistakes made two decades ago, well, yeah, almost two decades ago now, uh, as it relates to fast tracks, for example, and there's still that kind of bitterness. And even though they're two separate entities, Sometimes it feels like the public doesn't quite recognize that separation and that this is something different. So I don't know if those conversations have continued about further restricting the size of the districts to inc not include portions where they wouldn't receive substantial service, like Greeley, for example. I feel like those were three questions in one. But um, so there's no plans to district the district. District is a district. Um, and then to your point about just the challenges regarding um, previous ballot initiatives, taxing people are already experiencing in the service they get, that is our, one of our biggest challenges, right, is how do we continue to bring new service on board while also recognizing people are currently paying for and maybe feel like they didn't get all that they wanted. So that's absolutely front of mind. Um, you know, again, we're sort of in the nice spot where we're <laughs> we're still early enough that we can be visioning still. Um, and our finance committee has thought about this a lot and is doing some initial kind of principles regarding, um, for lack of a better term, kind of taxation fairness, taxation equity, and the idea of would it be possible that if you live further from the corridor, your tax, you know, your tax burden could be less. And I think what we're realizing is what is a nice principle and what is actually legal under state under state law are not often the same. But um, your your concerns regarding um, access to service regarding prior funding are very much um, recognized and things that we're working through. Wonderful. Um, should probably just keep a running tab of those questions. You can answer them right off a, the bat in the next meeting. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I mean, I could hand out FAQs. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, my next question relates to Amtrak and where they're fitting in currently, because I know there have been conversations prior to today. Uh, with Amtrak about having their own kind of corridor identification uh, for Cheyenne to more up and down the front range and they wanted to do like three round trips a day or something like that. Mm -hmm. So where exactly is Amtrak fitting in their plans, fitting in with what the front range passenger rail district is? I know they are potentially considered, could potentially be considered an operator for, for service, but I was under the impression they had their own service ideas and they very different than what district's service plan would be? Well, I can definitely say that Amtrak makes a lot of maps. They make a lot of lines on the maps. And I think that a lot of us are doing the same thing. Um, I would also say that it's, you know, and I think about this to add more convolutedness to this. Right now, FRA is doing a long distance study of trains that likely Amtrak would operate. And it is kind of quirky about who's doing what. But um, so Amtrak is one of the XPC members on our board and we remain in you know, close conversation as we kind of look through our service planning and things of that nature. Um, I, I can't exactly speak for what Amtrak's current planning is or what their, what their, you know, their current lines on the map, but um, definitely you know, we are a corridor they have that they're really excited about and we're excited to continue to work with them and learn from them and kind of share expertise and learn about other systems around the country. In terms of what things will look like 15 years from now when a train is running, who's operating it, you know, we're, we're not there yet, but we're excited to have them on the board and continue to learn from them. Okay, wonderful. And then my last question uh, also relates to service, particularly service levels. Mm -hmm. As the district continues its planning efforts and it continues getting closer to readying a ballot initiative, yeah. um, will that exact level of service be outlined? Is it going to look more like what um, Front Runner in Utah did for their starter service, or is it going to look more? somewhat similar to what Caltrain does in California where they have local trains and express trains and semi-express trains and, and stuff like that. Um, has the district kind of started narrowing down what that service level is? And I, I ask that only because I think if we take the front runner model, I'm not entirely sure it will pass. I don't think Frontrunner did when they first started. Um, 
however many years ago, is what would be palatable to residents to say, oh, I'm going to pay this tax at a couple trains a day that I can't even use because it's not convenient. So I think that your primary question is where are we at with service planning and what will be defined going into a ballot? And so we are still doing a lot of the modeling right now, especially regarding ridership, revenue, and freight, freight flows and what kind of capacity are on the track. So we don't have a defined service yet. Um, we also haven't determined yet if and how it would be phased in terms of how it's built and then also service levels. So. Um, I would be more than happy to grab coffee sometime and kind of get your down low on what you recommend in terms of what's successful system and what's been politically successful, but maybe not as strong implementation wise, but I don't have answers to those questions yet, unfortunately. Okay. I hear you. Thank you. I'm tracking you. Commissioner Adams. My concern is about the rail bed and I'm wondering, you've mentioned that your planned uh, uh, speed is 80, 80 miles an hour and I'm, interested in the work that might have been done on the uh, rated level for the existing rail bed and what that suggests for future expectations of what we will get with this 15 years from now when we are actually ready to operate because you know having traveled on the east coast and travel out of the country on on high-speed rail i would think that the existing freight rail bed is not going to be something. So I worry about creep here. I worry about creep in the cost of the project and what we think we're getting in 2023 versus what we get in 2030 of what we have to get of what consumers might expect in 2030 might be totally different and therefore the price of it might be considerably higher. Absolutely. Um, so there is a lot of existing conditions work that's being done right now to truly understand the quality of the track and then to determine what would need to be done from an upgrade perspective. It's, we're not looking at it as if track exists, track is okay. We're recognizing it has to be improvements. We're doing some really close analysis. Um, to your concern about, you know, are you going to make sure you did it right and will the cost be right and will the cost go up? I hear, I hear your point and I hear your concern about due diligence. Servicing. Yes, um, similar, similar topic. Um, yeah. you, know, you mentioned the uh, the corridors are on the on the freight um, existing network, and that means diesel. And um, as part of your analysis, you, you mentioned you have a you're trying to build a, a stable of consultants and all to uh, analyze these things. One one suggestion is is to look at alternatively fueled um, uh, locomotives. Um, whether it's biodiesel, electric, you know, hydrogen fueled in the future, I'm hoping that that's part of the consideration too, because we, of course, transition away from uh, traditional um, fossil fuels for you know, climate strategies, and this would be an, an excellent um, uh, example of, of how new technologies and future technologies can be deployed in this project. You know, I hate to brag, but um, this afternoon, uh, are you going to join us in Pueblo as well? So uh, General Manager Johnson and myself, and, and others, of course, are going to Pueblo to ride um, a hydrogen train at the testing facility down there. So um, very much appreciate what you're saying about emissions. And, you know, it's really funny. I was at an event this weekend, and someone was saying, I'm so excited about trains. It'll be so great for the environment. And I said, if the right kind of technology happens, enough people actually ride it, enough cars come off the road, and doesn't idle too long in the tracks, then absolutely that'll be great. And so I do recognize that... Um, Train to automatically in and of itself mean perfect, you know, emissions. So yes, absolutely, and we'll let you know how a hydrogen train goes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any final questions or comments? Being none. Thank you very much. Awesome. For being thank here. you all so much. Moving ahead to administrative items, member comment, other matters. Uh, we will start with the Colorado Department of Transportation report. See that. Across. I always get it wrong, and we're in mourning right now, so I want to make sure we get it correct going forward. I always make that mistake here and, and tomorrow night. But I think the major item that I want to update is that we have our Transportation Commission meeting uh, tomorrow, and we do have um, a new slate of commissioners that will be starting um, uh, starting this month. Uh, so we'll be going back to our regular cadence of 
of uh, uh, the workshop in the afternoon and the meeting on Thursday morning. So uh, that is the, the largest update that I have right now of items, but um, otherwise, um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Regional Transportation District reports. Johnson? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Williams? No. Okay. Thank you. First and foremost, I want you all to know that it is North American Rail Safety Week. It's September 18th through the 24th, and the whole intent is to educate the community on track safety. So um, RTD in conjunction with the Denver Transit operators, they actually operate our uh, all of our commuter rail lines, with the exception of the inline, were actually out and about at stations, educating and informing customers. So yesterday we were on the inline at East Lake and 124 station. This morning we were at the A line at Peoria station. On um, Thursday we will be at Old Town, Arvada on the G line once again at the A line on Thursday morning, 40th and Colorado station, and rounding out Friday uh, with the inline on Thornton um, Crossroads and 104th. And now I'll tell you why we're not doing it on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we're actually taking part in a safety drill uh, in conjunction with our Denver Transit operators in uh, Denver International Airport, as well as with emergency staff, uh, emergency providers throughout um, the region due to the fact that we need to ensure that we have a joint emergency operations drill in the event that something catastrophic happens. We have trained people, um, local emergency responders appropriately. So that will take place. Um, at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, which is tomorrow, we anticipate that for being about two hours. So there will be emergency vehicles in close proximity to like the Pena Bridge. And so we have disseminated information relative to that. And what we're going to do, since we're not going to have operations between Den and 64th and Pena, there will be a bus shuttle as well. Um, Director Williams made mention of this earlier, but I'd be remiss not to state that we have um, initiated our Zero Fare for Youth pilot program for individuals aged six years to 19 years of age. It is a pilot program which we're immensely proud of, and we are doing it for a year. We were able to work with our partners at the Federal Transit Administration to get a waiver due to the fact that um, the Title VI requirements in the Civil Rights Act of 64 in alignment with FTA circular guidance states you can only do a demo for six months, but nobody's matriculating in an academic school year for six months. So we were able to actually do a year. We are optimistically, um, I don't like to use the word hope, but we are optimistically expecting to have support at the state level as it relates to having um, funding mechanisms in place for the entire state of Colorado. We'll stay tuned to see what actually falls out during the legislative session. Um, bragging moment right here, RTD's bond rating, uh, S&P increased that just in August where we were uh, AA plus, now we're AAA plus as relates to fast track bonds and that is the highest rating in which one can receive. And last but not least, wanted to talk about the partnership program. We have talked about that ad nauseum, thanks to Dr. Cog, our sub-regional service councils, of course, our dynamite um, RTD staff. We were able to make an announcement on August 25th about those eight projects, leveraging our sub-regional service councils. And then, um, what I will share, recognizing that we've talked about alternative fuels um, and zero emission technology on August 25th, um, RTD announced that we basically entered to a contract with WSP. They are going to be working in tandem with us as we develop a facilities and fleet transition plan as it relates to alternative fuels. So that's going to be in the works, recognizing that we need to focus on getting back to basics in our facilities when we canceled our zero emission bus contract, it's not because we don't support it, it's because we didn't have the infrastructure and mechanisms in place to support transitioning in the future. So with this contract um, soon to be underway, we just had a kickoff meeting a couple of days ago, we will be in a better position to make informed decisions as we look to transition. So that's what I have, I'll yield the floor. Uh, one question, any um idea as to how better uh, the free fare for better air winds uh, the two months that 
Um, so this is anecdotal. Sure. Um, quite naturally, we saw one of our biggest ridership periods in history the weekend of July 14th and 15th. Um, what happened that weekend was uh, Taylor Swift's Eris, um, uh, concert in conjunction the same time frame, the Yankees were playing the Rockies and hordes and hordes of people. If you saw that aerial photograph, it was surreal. And I, another bragging moment, I am a part of the industry advisory uh, council where we're looking at major events, specifically the Olympics that'll be in Los Angeles. And my dear friend and colleague who runs LA Metro was like, okay, one of my staff said they were in Denver and that y'all did it right. So that made me feel great. And so I have to brag on that. So that's one thing in particular, we anticipate having our report come forward um, in the October timeframe. We have to get data quite naturally from our third party providers and that's where we are. So thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Adams, you had a- My question was exactly- Oh, well, there you go. Good. Great minds think alike. There you go. Austin. Uh, Director Ward, my apologies. That's fine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a quick question as it relates to the uh, electrification plan. What is the timeline since you've signed that contract? What is the timeline to get that um, plan with the contractor completed? And then what is the implementation timeline going to look like? So as it relates to the contract that we've initiated with WSP, we anticipate that to be roughly about 18 months. And um, can you qualify your statements about implementation because I'm not certain? Yeah, so once you have that, so after the 18 months you have that, what is the, the plan going to look like? What is that implementation, like how long is it going to take you to implement changes to support electrification of buses and rehab of facilities? and that stuff, if that helps clarify. Thank you very much, um, Director. Uh, as it relates to that, we need the plan for all intents and purposes because our facilities are old, like we don't have uh, uh, thermal, uh, thermal suppression, we don't have um, adequate um, harnessing and things of the like. So we have to ensure that we have an understanding of where might there be properties that we can leverage. It may be more cost effective to actually acquire a facility, then actually deal with what we have, recognizing our youngest facility is probably close to, what is that, like 36, 37 years old? And so we are definitely behind the eight ball. Um, and then also as it relates to fleet, uh, recognizing that we have leveraged um, federal dollars, one keeps a um, asset, specifically a commercial bus, either for 12 years or 500,000 miles. Um, we would not need to take delivery of a new vehicle until 2028. And so all of that comes into play as we look at it holistically. So I give you all that context to say I can't necessarily give you a time frame because I don't know what I don't know at this time. Okay, wonderful. Thank um, you. Yeah, I know our, our the Boulder Garage has roots growing into the building from trees <laughs> and plants. It's fun. Um, and then my next question as it relates to the um, safety drill you're doing with CIA uh, and all the other partners, I assume that's, that that is the reason it's shutting down the A-line. Is that normal for other transit agencies for that type of practice to be done on a mainline shutdown service? Most definitely, I can speak firsthand. Um, when I worked at the Bay Area Rapid Transit District in Oakland, California, I actually volunteered to be in the Trans Bay Tube and be injured. And we had SFPD, OPD, um, AC Transit providing shuttle bus service. So it is very common. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Because we need to know what's happening in a real life environment, not doing something via a tabletop. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the Regional Air Quality Council report. Mr. Silverstein. Oh, thank you. And um, uh, just a couple um, notes. Encourage all Dr. Cog members and uh, essentially local governments and, and state agencies, transportation districts to take advantage of, of the Regional Air Quality Council's incentives for lawn and garden equipment. We've just received an additional infusion of, of new monies so that we can help electrify lawn and garden equipment uh, throughout our region. So um, we still have money left and it's always a, sometimes it's a challenge to, uh, to give away money. And uh, we just encourage all um, 
you know, uh, anyone in the public uh, sector to apply for our grant dollars. And um, we are advancing our um, lawn and garden um, emission reduction proposal to the Air Quality Control Commission this week, starting um, Wednesday afternoon is the opening uh, remarks. And so the Air Quality Control Commission will be considering our uh, prohibitions on, lawn, on small lawn and garden equipment sales and use um, moving forward in the rulemaking process that, that really takes um, about a three-month uh, window through the fall and into, um, into December. And along with that is our revised air quality plan for summertime ozone that uh, we project gets us into compliance with the, uh, the weaker of the two standards uh, by 2027. And that's, that's great news for the region, um, both administratively in, that, um, in, in the process of air quality planning and working with the federal government and other um, agencies, but also improvements in public health projecting that um, ozone concentrations will fall um, in the um, in, in the face of, of, of expanding growth in our region that we're all experiencing, and so that's good news as well. So the the Air Quality Control Commission will be considering all of these proposals, um, uh, in addition to a number of proposals that uh, the state um, Department of Health and Environment are advancing um, for um, industrial equipment, oil and gas equipment, and operations, et cetera. And um, the, the Air Quality Control Commission is also considering um, revised vehicle uh, electrification requirements that brings us to 80% electric vehicle mandate sales by um, the early 2030s. And so the electrification of our transportation system, you know, will continue with that, um, that consideration as well. So um, that's just some, some items for everyone's interest um, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, if you parked down in the garage, be sure to get your uh, out from uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, any other matters by members? Any announcements? Okay. Our next meeting is on Tuesday morning, October 17th. We will see you then. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for being here today. Have a great day. Meeting adjourned.